I want to go ahead and uh, introduce myself real quick because we really do want to talk a lot about uh, innovation and watch duty, which is an example of, of a great disaster innovation um, and how that sort of occurs. And I, I'm sure we have lots of good examples of that. Um, my name's Heather Melton. I work with FEMA in the Interagency Recovery Coordination Group, which is focused on long-term recovery of the state and local communities. Um, and I recently moved from the GIS group uh, management over to community assistance, which you may have heard of as CPCB, uh, community <clears throat> planning and capacity building. It's been renamed to community assistance, but it does the same thing. Work with local communities, identify the most uh, impacted and vulnerable communities, provide additional assistance, technical assistance, um, assistance with planning, and just thinking through recovery and connecting them with resources, most importantly, introducing them to all the federal agencies who will be on site as part of the RSF system um, and educating them about grants and funds uh, available from those agencies to help with recovery. So that's that's my role now. My, my past though has been a lot in working with GIS and also um, organizations a lot like John's, which we would call a volunteer technical community, meaning we have a high impact group of dedicated volunteers with a very special set of skills and they are being used through a specific app or program to benefit uh, disaster survivors those who are in the way of the disaster um, and helping them cope with survive and hopefully thrive afterwards so um, I've been involved with several of these different volunteer technical communities, mostly on the international side, that they tend to be deployed very often in lesser developed nations because those folks have a lot fewer resources, um, but uh, they're also very important here in the US. And so I'm very interested in hearing more from John today about watch duty. Um, well, she, uh, unlike um, Heather, um, who has a real background uh, in disaster management, um, I, uh, I have a uh, birth by fire, like many of you in this room, ultimately the Wallbridge fire uh, touched the edge of my property and after doing mop up alone at night um, and realizing that you're often on your own in these situations, I realized that if I was gonna stay in Sonoma County in the wildlands, I was gonna have to do something. Um, this was the third event I had had there. The first time there was a helicopter with a bucket flying over my house, trying to get me to leave. I thought I wanted to get water out of my pool, little did I realize that he was trying to get me the hell out of there. Um, which I have not done and I don't evacuate anymore uh, for this reason. And so I've learned to fight for myself and fight for my community. Um, Dave Shue, I think, said it well the other day that we need to band together um, and help whether the government wants you to or not. Uh, they eventually will understand um, and watch you is a great example of that. Now I work with many governments, um, mostly outside of California and Northern California, who are underserved. Um, these are, we are in a first world country, um, and these organizations, um, DEMs and OESs have, you know, some of these counties like Siskiyou and Del Norte work with us. They have 50,000 residents in that county. They barely have a GIS person. They might not even know what GIS means. Um, and so it's, it's been an honor to be able to help these organizations actually find, find their footing and, and give them something for free, which is what Watch Duty has been able to do. Cool. So um, my first question is, you, you were a disaster survivor, but then how did that lead you to um, come up with the idea you had to build this system? You know, it was, um, I think, actually, um, Jennifer said it well, a lot of us ended up, you know, at three o'clock in the morning on Twitter and Facebook, listening to radios, listening to random people trying to, you know, piece together the story. And so, uh, to me, it was it was obvious. I didn't know what it looked like yet, but I knew what the problem was. And I think that was one of the most important things to start with is like, what is actually wrong, not what is working. Because um, if I ask folks in the government, they would say, oh, we have this process and this works. And I'd say, well, from a user experience perspective, living in the wildlands, I can tell you that that does not work. And so the first thing was to figure out what to do. And then it took me another nine months to convince myself that this was actually a good idea. Um, for who I've learned after starting many companies that uh, convincing yourself you're not crazy is one of the most important things you can do. Um, and there are many things I've not built because I told myself I was nuts. Uh, this one happened to work. So one of my backgrounds is in social innovation and social entrepreneurship uh, as part of my 
a degree at Tulane University, and um, everyone that was in this incubator started some sort of social innovation project. Um, and from that, I recognized a couple of things. One is the tools you need to build something new are probably already available. They're just not put together in that toolbox. And so rather than trying to build a whole new data set or a whole new tool from scratch, really make sure, understand the market that's out there. It's probably available already. And this is part of the brilliance of Watch Duty is it's using widely available data streams, um, but put together in a way that's most useful, most effective, and then implementing those volunteers who really know how to work with that data. Um, the second thing I learned is, is that you sometimes the tools are built elsewhere and you don't need to reinvent the wheel building that tool. It's you know bringing something that's small in one place, bringing it to scale, so it's useful in a lot of places is, is just as innovative an approach in my mind. Um, and just as important because again, we all know that bringing something to scale is, is often the hardest part. So, um, so some other um, things that we wanted to talk about, the confidence gap. I think that's a really important thing to address here. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about uh, what I call go to market from my last profession, which is um, high tech software, is that going to market is one of the most challenging things you can ever do is getting things into millions of people's hands is extremely, extremely hard. Uh, if you build it, they will not come. That is not how this works. I have watched this fail hundreds of times and I've done it myself when I was a much younger man. So uh, I'm not sitting here telling you I know how to do it. What I'm telling you is never underestimate how much money and time you will spend going to market and getting something out there. Um, we had an interesting turn of events uh, this year where we're now in 11 states and many of these other states have been extremely apt to work with us. Um, so I got a phone call from the OES um, in uh, Spokane, Washington after the Gray Fire in Oregon fires happened and burned several houses down. A couple of lives were again lost in a fire because they're not being alerted, which continues to happen um, in smaller scales in Lahaina and Tubbs, but it keeps happening. And he called us up and they said, uh, we want to work with you. We want to give you all of our data. And we were just, first of all, stunned um, that that happened because usually we're beating doors down to get meetings. And now people are coming to us and asking us, um, can we help? And those fires were particularly interesting because, again, of the structures lost uh, and, and how quickly they spread. But ultimately, it came down to he called us up and he said, I have 5,000 users who've downloaded CoRed. How many users do you have? And I, I looked up on the computer quickly and I said, we have 300,000 new users in your county in one week. And so what has happened is we have gone to market and we have won, right? And now we're able to really help wield what we have and offer those services to other governments who are understanding that we are here to help. We are a nonprofit. We're trying to do the best because we live here too. We've been through fire. Awesome. Um, I did want to ask, I forgot earlier, how many people here have watch duty on their phone? Yeah, John told me that would happen. Um, <laughs> um, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, it's not yet on the FEMA list of approved apps for FEMA phones. So that's something we're working on. Um, I think I do want to recognize while FEMA is known and the federal government in general, there's been some really amazing work being done, the bipartisan group is making huge headway and that's so important. We all know the federal system is slow and kludgy and, and hard to move, but the recognition of climate change and the rapidity at which changes are happening is accelerating adoption of innovative products and ideas. So continue to think of your innovation, continue to test them, continue to share them in forums like this. I've been doing, the last three days have just been so valuable to me because I'm really hearing what the frustrations are, but also how have some of the trouble, I mean, how how's the troubleshooting happening at the local level? We need to understand that better so that we can make it work better. Um, um, so, so this whole innovation process and adoption process, we're gonna see it speed up. We're gonna see new ideas popping up every every disaster. Um, the beacon box idea, I really love that because we need to remember that a lot of first responders are not from our area. They don't know how to get around or where the bad spots are. Um, 
So let's talk some more about watch duty. Um, what was your timeline in terms of developing at, to this full adoption? Yeah, I mean, this is the weird part is that we built watch duty in 80 days with no money. Um, we have volunteers who care about these problems and are high tech and intelligent. All of our servers were donated from Amazon, Heroku, Salesforce, everybody else. And we were able to get something out and live extraordinarily quickly. That was in 2021 of August, August 11th. So we're almost 26 months into it, I guess. Um, and being a nonprofit affords us that ability to do that, um, not only for the engineering volunteers, but also for the, the radio reporters and some are in this room and some are related to people in this room, um, who've been doing this on their own volition for their community for a long time, whether it was the Valley fire, the Tubbs fire, whatever it was, people turn to Facebook and Twitter for this. And so it was a matter of us hunting to find all those people and convince them that we were not disaster capitalists, that we were building a nonprofit and that what they were doing was extremely powerful. And we're going to get, build them the best megaphone they could possibly use. And so that's kind of that timeline uh, of the first year. And then in 2022, we launched all of California. Um, and then just this year in May, we launched all of the American West 11, 11 states. So it's been quick and cheap. Does that include Hawaii and Alaska? Unfortunately, those two are not there and we're actually trying to get into Hawaii currently. Um, it's, it's funny because we work with a lot of radio scanners and, and ham radio operators who love to communicate, but they hide in plain sight. And so finding them is actually somewhat challenging. So I think we're closing in on, on Hawaii, which is great. And what happened in Lahaina has happened many times. And that was emergency managers running a playbook that, that, I don't know why they didn't run the tsunami playbook and said, whatever, press every button I have, alert every damn human being on earth, who cares, right? But people are worried about their jobs, I guess, and ICS structures and whatever happened. We don't have those problems, right? We do what we believe is right, and that's what makes us different and faster and more nimble than some of these organizations. Tell us more about your volunteer model, who, who the ham radio operators are, how, they, how that part works. I, I understand yeah. the app on the phone, but... Yeah, I mean, the, it's a good question. I mean, what's really interesting is the software is not hard to build. Again, building things is not hard. Getting it out there and getting to market is really hard. And the volunteers are active and retired first responders, dispatchers. We just got someone who literally lives in a lookout all summer long. People who are 35-year-old wildfire, you know, uh, veterans who still have the radio chirping in the background, like they can't retire. You know, it's in their blood. And so it's such a beautiful thing for us to give these men and women a, a, another job like in their retirement because they, they weren't stopping anyway. Their phone was always ringing when there was a fire because everyone knows that they're the retired fire captain who moved to Northern Nevada or whatever it may be. And so it's really a beautiful story of all the people inside the organization more so than the software, which is just ones and zeros and has no heart, right? The people who run this and what they do is really what the beautiful part of this organization. And so they, they monitor radio, uh, police scanners, emergency management? Not police, luckily. No. Um, uh, we're not trying to let people know that there's a car accident on the side of the road and things that don't affect the greater community as a whole. Um, but what we do is we've built lots of bots and machines. Um, a better way to describe it is we have software that listens to 911 dispatches, CHP dispatches, uh, airplane circling detection for air attack, um, Shoot, what else do we have? We even have radios in the woods that do tone out detection. Uh, and for the firefighters who know what this is, but tone outs are um, uh, the dispatch ordering different pieces of uh, heavy equipment, whether that's uh, air support, um, apparatus, strike teams, their dial tones, and you hear them in plain, plain uh, audio over the radio. And so we listen to all those with machines. So now anyone who orders heavy equipment in California we know about it often faster than the first responders on the other end because of where we intercept that through the chain of command. So we are building systems on top of what is important but old. Um, and so we can see things that others can't faster. I love this idea of integrating uh, and, and the beacon box, Shay, um, I was talked about the integrating analog and digital um, together to make this new toolbox that incorporates all these best practices. Um, I am out of questions. I have what questions else for you. Wanna... Oh, wait. Oh. Um, so I think that FEMA should be running watch duty or someone in the, in the federal or larger government. 
Let me explain why. Not because I think they're going to do a better job. I'm getting people shaking their hands. No, we wouldn't have built this if it had to be built and what I or didn't have to be built. And what I come to realize is like, even if your DEM is a really good one or your OAS, whatever it is in your county, the problem is these, you live on borders, first of all, of fires coming from all different areas. They come from different counties uh, and land in your county. Uh, your county might have a really bad DEM or OAS and you have bad infrastructure and this county has good infrastructure. The problem is natural disasters don't care about your borders. These are all fake made up things that we vote upon, that we live in, that don't mean anything to a disaster. And so if we're going to try and sell software or services to these organizations who are not taking an 80,000 foot approach, we're going to get the same exact results. If I gave watch duty to every government, they would still fail. And it's not because they're not, their process doesn't allow them to do that. And the process needs to change. We must be faster and quicker and lighter because wildfires are some of the fastest moving disasters on earth. Tornadoes are up there as well, but we need to adapt quickly. And I don't see any other way than looking 80,000 feet down and saying, here's the fire coming. There are humans here, not, oh, there's a border. Let's go wake up that jurisdiction's OES and tell them that they need to start moving. Like we need to move now. And this is really important. So I'm trying to figure out like how this starts to make its way up to a larger global scale so we can solve that issue. I don't, it's more of a comment than a statement, but I guess my question for you is like, what else have you seen like this work in the States or otherwise? Like there's GIS mapping course, there's other people doing this, but why did watch duty have to show up? Like I, I'm still confused as to why I'm here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Um, FEMA is built around one disaster at a time and our funding works that way as well. Um, ongoing persistent funding uh, as you've seen, and I'm sure experienced, is, is, is a rare thing and only affects a few programs. Um, and every other piece of funding is doled out by disaster. So if you want to do something that spans the whole organization and the entire year for many years, that funding is very, very difficult to come up with because it's not going to be Stafford Act funding. Stafford Act funding dictates disaster by disaster, money is handed out. So we have developed a few pieces of software in-house, um, usually in partnership with Argonne National Laboratory. Um, they have a great shop there. They're getting much more involved with FEMA and building tools for FEMA. So if anybody's used the Wrapped tool, which is a fee found on FEMA.gov, that is one. It includes uh, the ability to add data, and it includes community resilience indicator values. Um, which you can compare against adding social vulnerability index values. So it's just two different ways of looking at those vulnerability factors. You can do pre-planning for disasters themselves using the RAP tool. So it's a tool that I would encourage you to look at, but it is designed for you to interact with and build plans with. It is not one that's feeding you uh, real-time information. So I think the real-time information is, is the key and FEMA other than the NRCC and DC, which watches the whole country, we're not really monitor we're monitoring, we're gathering information more than amplifying information. And I think that's a really good point that that's part of what we're missing in our response arena nationwide is a nationwide system. I think too, if I may just interject here, that one of the things that surprised me when we had our disaster is I totally thought there was this huge system that was gonna come up and specifically understand our unprecedented disaster and show up and they were gonna be leaders and they were gonna tell me what to do and I would go over in the corner and I would do my thing. And to become like a leader in that space during that time, I found shocking. But now I understand that, you know, FEMA is set up for like 360 million people. It's not set up for individual disasters. Like we are the leaders. You are the leaders. We are responsible for innovation. That's a perfectly appropriate thing. Like sometimes people say to me, how'd you get that job? And I'm like, no competition. Like, at all. Plus, and I made it up, you know, according to what was needed at the time. But it's kind of like, how'd you get that job, John? I took it. You took it. 
right? You made it up. Is there a lot of competition for it? Did you have to like, you know, beat down? No, it wasn't that way at all. That's very much the space of disaster and, and with complex perils, what was just brought up, like multiple disasters. Now we've all seen what that looks like with COVID on top of the worst wildfire season ever in Oregon and, you know, and um, Washington. Like we have to be able to build resilience inside of ourselves and our communities. It doesn't mean that FEMA doesn't have work to do, that we can't apply tech, but we are also responsible and you are, there's room for you. There's room for your leadership and to innovate. And if you're like, I have a great idea, you know what, it's probably a great idea. You probably take that on too. So I wanna just, that's my editorializing, okay. No, and I think I think that's a great point. What we see in IRC is, um, Areas where there's a lot of well-educated people with good insurance and motivation, um, they do the best. And we hope that that spills over to their neighboring communities that are less well-informed, less rich, whatever. Meaning that they recover the best. But so much of the innovation that we see is happening in rural and frontier communities because they know how to depend on each other. But what they don't, or what they aren't great at, y'all, is like telling other people what you've done because you're so busy for like five to 10 to 15 years doing your own recovery. You're not necessarily on Facebook Reels like I am, right? I mean, and I get that. So that, I just wanted to be clear because I know what you're saying, yeah. And I appreciate your, uh, I've been watching your uh, fire preparedness red flag day videos. <laughs> I was very those. tired and I look it. So. <laughs> well, I think what was really interesting that I want uh, people in this room to know that I wasn't aware of is how FEMA is trying to speed things up and how that's actually causing strange issues that are unintended. And the high I think is a great example of that. Yeah. So there's a lot of discussion now. Right now, our group, the, the interagency recovery coordination group tends to move slowly, but that is um, because, not that we want to move slowly, we often arrive on site and the state's not ready to start talking about recovery. Local communities might not be ready to talk about recovery. People who are still working on response, they're the ones who then have to turn to recovery and they're still working on response. They're, they don't have the bandwidth. So we often will spend two, three months researching, learning more about the communities, and waiting for them to be ready to engage. Um, and and um, that starts to break our budget because we're having all these people and all these agencies, you know, waiting to engage. They're talking about a new timeline that's going to be much more expedited. And so I need to encourage all the communities here to do exactly what the former director of emergency management here in Sonoma County said, which is up, keep your plans updated. This is not just your hazard mitigation plan and your emergency management plan. This is your economic development plan, your comprehensive land use plan. Make sure that those are updated. Make sure that your community has made decisions about what they want to do in their future. And make sure that that's ready to pull off the shelf the minute you have an, an incident because that is the fastest way to get the recovery conversation started. If we need to go through the initial rounds of public engagement again, it's going to take months and years. So the best advice I can give to a community, is, especially if we're gonna expedite these timelines, which we're, we're being pretty clear that we don't think that they're gonna work that well, um, is to have those plans updated and ready. And of course, for our frontier and rural communities, sometimes that's the piece that's hard. And also that there's room for innovation. Like when we talk about systems and app, like that was not created by, and I do love Cal Fire to be clear, super fan, Mike Wink here, yay. I know, he knows, super fan. But government is different and slow and requires, it's for everyone, it has different constraints that nonprofits, again, I know you've heard this, and the private sector don't have. Like I would love if a community could have a watch duty. It was like FEMA duty. It was like incoming, you must ask for a housing mission. 
incoming. Yes, you must request the mental health care grant that you need from there. Like, it should not be that I have a rural community supervisor calling me and being like, why don't I have a housing mission? And I'm like, but because you have to ask for it. Do you know, like that kind of thing, like here it comes, you know, that is an area of innovation that's going to come from the private sector, but tech. Tech cannot solve everything, but boy, it can solve a lot. And I know everyone's afraid of AI, but I am not. It's making my life better. How do you think I got all these catchy titles? Hmm? Do you think I worked all day on that? I did not. I got that done in about 10 minutes. Now, some of them, you'd be like, that explains a lot. But for others, you were like, yeah, empowering preparedness. But this is true, though. It's going to come from minds that go, well, why isn't there? Why doesn't, if next time you think, why doesn't someone do that? You can, in fact, be that someone. That's, you know, side note. Yeah. And and one, one thing I want to also suggest to communities is if you have a housing nonprofit that is well-known, trusted, consider asking them to help head your housing RSF at your local level or even at your state level. Because the state emergency management department, that person's not gonna be ready in time. So if you can have a nonprofit or someone well-versed in that step in and help, that can also help facilitate that conversation, I think a lot faster. And that goes for lots of different nonprofits. And then to not assume that um, all emergency managers are created equal, like we saw in Lahaina, not no experience in that whatsoever. And so they are, we're watching them all learn in real time. And the amount of how painful that is for everyone from here, from a community, I've gotten so many of your text messages, like, I'll go, I'll help, what do they need? Like hyperventilating all day from August 8th until for about the first two weeks. So all of those things, though, a lot of that could be um, mitigated and changed. This is my version of not of um, helping with your fireside chat. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you. Um, we do have about 30 seconds. Do we have one question? Uh, th maybe you don't have enough time to answer this because this is about a day-long discussion, but it's about evacuations. And I'd like to maybe we'll have to have a private conversation, but drilling into the evacuations, the sad reality from statistical analysis today is the vast majority of fatalities in wildfires today is people who have not been able to get out or have died during their evacuation process. That's just the numbers. So my question is that I believe the tactics and strategies with as good of innovation as people can do today is not changed from the decades of the way we've always done it to address the massive changes in fire behavior, severity, speed, all those kind of things. And I'm really curious if Watch Duty is addressing that and is maybe integrating some better performance measures to help people get out more safely. Uh, it's a great question and I'm gonna answer it in two parts. The first is um, I can probably think of a couple hundred emails or notes we've gotten of people who tell us that they are down the road with their trailer full of animals with fire in the rear view mirror and they tell me that the government message comes through. I get that all the time. We get people who write us checks and say, I almost died the mill fire. You saved my life. So that's already happening. I can guarantee that. What's coming next is we are starting to build a consolidated map of all of the evacuation zones for the entirety of California and then the rest of the West. All the information and data will be in one place. It will not be scattered anymore. This is the problem we are solving. So it is not done, but I guarantee you I'm gonna fight as hard as I goddamn can to solve it. Uh, Brandy Ferguson, Holiday Farm Fire, Oregon. Um, thank you, John and Heather, for sharing all of this. Um, I am, I do have Watch Duty on my phone. I am a member. You are a nonprofit. That is why you are so valuable to everybody in this room and beyond. You are nimble, like so many of the nonprofits in this room. You can, you're filling the gap where government leaves off. That is the whole purpose of nonprofits. And please stay a nonprofit <laughs> because you share, shared the people behind um, helping to gather the information, our volunteers, or you know, because they care. They're doing the work in a moment's notice, they're pivoting because they care, it will change. 
it will not be the same. So just wanted to put that out there. Wanted to also just quickly acknowledge one of the other valuable assets to your platform is the fire, historic fire footprints. So valuable as we're learning about fire and communities and how the fire moves and, and it, it's just like that historic footprint data I have never found anywhere else. And I would actually, I think it's the last five years is what you share. I would love to actually see it the last 10 years. And I'm in Oregon. I can only imagine the folks in California. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we have a lot more coming. We're, we'll be adding vegetation layers and things of that nature. By the way, thank you for being a supporter of the nonprofit. Uh, as long as I'm here, that will continue. Um, this is, all my volunteers will revolt if that ever changes. Uh, I. I am not worried about it ever having to change. And we're making a great amount of money from membership dues. So we're studying AARP and AAA who have done the same thing. They're all nonprofits and you pay to be a member and we know the model works. We know there's millions of people affected by this. So we see no reason to change. Um, but on your second point, there's a lot of other layers. That layer exists. All these are Esri layers that are in GIS everywhere, right? They're on other maps, they're on Wi-Fi or from UCSD, they're all over the place, but people are not making it easy to use and putting it in your pocket. And I think that's the difference. Um, but we have a bunch of other crazy stuff coming out. We're working with Cal HHS and a bunch of other governments. We are gonna start mapping all the evacuation shelters. What's inside them? Do they take animals or people? We get all these people who are looking for answers and now we have folks who are giving us that information. So we're gonna build tools for the evacuation shelters to help. And the final thing we're doing is we are working with Planet Labs and a couple other companies to provide real-time satellite imagery. So you'll be able to see everything from fire retardant to burn scars from the days before. And so we've only begun to scratch the surface of how much you're about to see. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, do become, you can donate monthly. I know we do, just so you know, side notes, not all like big gifts and everything. Like little gifts are good too. It's all small donations. And I, I also love that I can look and I'm like, okay, Cal Fire has sent things from Mather. Okay, they've sending them back now, forward stop motion, all of that, and prescribed burns because here we freak out every time we have a prescribed. We like them in theory, but then when they happen, people are like, <laughs> and then we and then we can look on Watch Duty. We know where it is. We know it's being handled and everyone calms down so it also helps the public officials not be inundated so thank you both so so much i really appreciate it thank you thanks very much <laughs>